I eventually left and took my equity and they replaced me with a new CEO. And over the next three years, they drove the business into the ground. Welcome to Beyond the Fail, the podcast where we talk to leaders and entrepreneurs about their biggest business failures. We'll deep dive into how they overcame these setbacks, the lessons they learned from them, all to help you gain valuable insights. Failure is an essential part of the business journey, as well as being the key to success. So we're here to show you how to thrive from it. Our guest today, Shah Wasmund, is a force to be reckoned with. She's not only worked with legends in the boxing world like Chris Eubank during one of the most iconic moments in British boxing history, but she's also been recognized by the Sunday Times as one of the top most influential entrepreneurs in the UK. At the age of 21, she became the world's only licensed female boxing manager, orchestrating a whopping 22 world title fights. Her journey has been nothing short of incredible, working with household names like Sir James Dyson around a kitchen table in the 1990s, long before his brand became a multi-billion pound empire. That's not all. She's been headhunted by none other than Sir Richard Branson himself. She's built multiple seven-figure businesses from the ground up and even sold one of them for multiple seven figures and if that's not impressive enough she's also received an mbe from the queen for outstanding achievements in entrepreneurship and business and she's also a best-selling author one of our books held the number one spot 14 months in wh smith in this episode shah shares her experiences navigating trying to raise capital during the 2008 financial crisis her battles with her board about the direction of that business and how despite multiple personal and business setbacks her resilience and her belief remains unshakable this is beyond the fail with Shah Wasmond. Shah welcome thanks so much for being here I'm super excited to have you on it's been a long time coming so Shah would you say that you've always been an entrepreneur? 100%. I think there is a conversation, are entrepreneurs born or are they bred? And I think it can be both, but I, I don't, I think the concept of teaching entrepreneurialism is sound because there are aspects of it that you can teach. But in my opinion, I think that the vast majority of people, quite frankly, quite rightly, don't have the appetite to be an entrepreneur because it's not an easy journey. And so I think you have to have a particular personality type. Um, I'm not saying everybody has to be an extrovert. There's plenty of very successful introvert entrepreneurs, mm. but you have to have a certain type of resilience and determination and drive and tenacity and a belief in yourself. And I think there are, there are so many things that can go wrong. I feel like in today's society, we you know, social media very much plays up the, the, the upside of being an entrepreneur, but doesn't actually show you the downside of being an entrepreneur. And so, um, I, I think for me, I think I'm probably unemployable. I think I'm too opinionated. I think I always look at things and I want to change something. And, you know, I, I, I think it felt for me a very natural path for me to follow. I, I didn't really want to work for anyone else. Where do you think that that kind of came from? If, if you've described yourself as an entrepreneur unequivocally, well, where has that come from? I'm um, growing up incredibly poor, uh, living in a hostel for homeless families, um, growing up on the welfare state system, never having any money, uh, and not wanting to live like that, to be quite honest, and recognizing that if it was going to change, then you know, I had to be responsible for changing it for myself, that, that nobody else was going to do it for me. I don't come from uh, generational wealth in any stretch of the imagination. I didn't have any role models around me, so I didn't have anyone that I could look to or turn to for help or support or advice. I had nobody who's going to open a door or give me a leg up. And so if you're in that situation, which I know so many people are, you you don't really have a choice other than to not have it or create it for yourself. Because it's not going to be given to you. Did you have any entrepreneurial role models, though, around you? Anyone you looked no, up none. to in that space? None. None whatsoever. So is that purely come from a, a drive to better yourself and better your circumstances? 
Um, I think it comes from a drive to not be dirt poor and a drive to have some control and sovereignty over my life. And also very much a drive to take care of the people that I love and care about. Because for me, it was always about, I wanted to take care of my mom and I wanted to take care of my nan. I come from a very strong matriarchal family, single parent family. My mom, you know, my, my mom was a teacher. My nan was um, the, the cook at a, a local state primary school. So neither of them earned any money, um, but they did good, right? They, 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 they were both very much the type of women who would help anyone and always wanted to, and, and that's where I benefited, right? So we didn't have any money, but I was very fortunate that even though we didn't have money, my mom 100% brought me up to believe that I could do anything I wanted to do. And that just because she didn't have money did not mean that that had to be my future. And so for me, it wasn't just about changing my own trajectory. It was about taking care of my family. Do you think that you can still be an entrepreneur, but from a, I suppose, a, a, a more middle-class and richer background? Or do you think you have to have that, that kind of, I suppose, poorer, maybe struggling background? interesting question so i think you can do it from both backgrounds but i think your drive is different and i think that in some ways whilst theoretically i wish my background had been easier i'm also very cognizant that actually with my driving force and so it's an interesting conversation because you know my son has led a very different life to me so he has gone, you know, he lives uh, in a multi-million pound house on a royal park and has two homes and goes to Barbados every year and, and has been in private school his whole life. And, you know, to his credit, he, um, he doesn't take money for granted. However, his reality is very, very different to mine. And what I struggle with as a first generation person with money is how do I make sure that he still has the same drive and it's really difficult. It's really, really difficult because I had no choice other than to work because if I wanted anything, I had, I did, I haven't had anybody give me money since I was 13. So how do I make sure that he has that drive? It's, it's, a, it, it, it's an interesting conversation, which I think a lot of first generational wealth will resonate with. Absolutely. Will it, do you think he will become an entrepreneur? Or is he going oh, down a different path? No, for sure. He's already told me he's not even sure he's going to university. So, yeah, he 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 he's said he doesn't he wants to do his own thing, but he's not sure what he wants that to be. So he's happy to to do other things and work for other people for a while, as long as what the 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 direction is, he's getting experience to go and figure out what he wants to do for himself. And I understand that because I think if you've grown up in an entrepreneurial household. And you've seen the passion that, you know, your parents have for what they do and the flexibility that they have. Because make no mistake, I, I work, I reckon I work longer hours than anyone in a corporate job, but then my hours. And if I, I have never missed anything for him for school for any reason, uh, no board meeting is set up to conflict with anything that he's doing. And if I need to stop something, I'm gone. And, and I think that that level of flexibility, um, if you've grown up with that, it's hard to then have a job that tells you what to do, when to do it, where to go, you know. So I, I think it's quite hard. But equally, sorry, equally, I've just said, I think it's also hard for us us people who, who are first generation because we want our kids to have the same drive and hustle that we do. And yet, by definition, they don't, they, they have needed to have it, right? So but what I was those. thinking when you... It is a double-edged sword. I think, but I, I think interestingly, when you talk, we're talking about that. He's got what you didn't have, so he's got an entrepreneurial role model. He does. Oh, which he obviously has, has a, mm, of course, yeah. which obviously gives yeah. him a massive advantage and a and a strong influence to then potentially follow that path. Yeah, I, I think so. I think that's definitely a, a key. And like over the summer, he went and worked for Black Sea, which is a um, small micro fund um run by an amazing guy called carl loco and it's uh focused on funding black founded and black co-founded businesses and he, he went and did work experience there 
And so he's been he's been open to so many different influences in so many different sectors and uh, in tech, in music, in entertainment, yeah. in sport, in, you know, my God, hold up the story, but we had Chris Eubank Sr. stay with us over Christmas. And so he had, yeah, you know, he's had so much input from so many people. Mm. And, and I know he's very grateful for that. So that definitely, he definitely can't say he hasn't had any role models. No, that's, that's uh, an amazing kind of and unique set of circumstances for him. Yeah. So we're just going to sort of fast forward a little bit then and just focus on the sort of failure that story that you're going to sort of, and we're going to delve into today. So do you want to tell us about what you sort of see as one of the, the sort of biggest failures or setbacks in your career? Yeah, definitely. So I think everybody's got that thing that got away, right? Whether it's a relationship or a business or bone, we've all got something that we're like, yeah, that's the one. That's the one that got away. And for me, it was a company that I set up called Smarter, S-M-A-R-T-A. And we set it up in 2008, 2009. Um, I say we, it was my idea, but we had BC backing. And um, the challenge we had started from, from the outset, which was that we were raising money at the time that we just got our tiny roll. It, we, we were raising money when the banks were collapsing in 2008, 2009. So straight out the gate, we had to, um, we, we basically had a third of the investment that we anticipated. So we took the money in that we, we had, and we had to cut our cloth accordingly. And we did some incredible thing. I got a million pound of sponsorship out of RBS in that West. I mean, who the hell does that? But, During the uh, banking but, crisis. <laughs> yes, during a banking crisis. And, and, and because I said, right now is when you need to be doing this even more than ever, because you need to be, showing support for small businesses. And I was absolutely right. But you would think that, you know, um, I was, I, I have always been super passionate about leveling the playing field when it comes to um, access to business and helping small businesses grow when they don't have role models and they don't have people to help fund them. And and my premise for Smarter was to to do exactly that, to level the playing field and to provide free advice and free support from real entrepreneurs and real business people to other entrepreneurs who, who were starting out. And the banks funded it. And it looked really good for the banks and it was absolutely the right thing for them to do. And it was a commercial venture. It wasn't a, a, a charity or, or a not-for-profit. And um, we did incredibly well. Like We became the largest site in the UK for uh, small businesses um, and, and entrepreneurs. We... Um, had the Smash 100 Awards, which were the biggest awards of their, of any business awards during their time. And where we went wrong was we believed in content and we believed in online courses and we believed in online education and we believed in creating a community. But the board believed in creating software for the bank. And whilst I could see that that was a, a revenue driver and when times are tough, you have to follow the revenue so that you can keep, I get all that. But the board didn't understand the future in the way that we did it instinctively because the board were too successful. The board were made up of people who were, you know, had more money than they could spend in their entire lifetime. So they were too far removed from the regular business person who was using our services. And my belief was that we need to build a community. And if we build a community, the money will come, right? Now, Facebook believed the same thing, but they had, the difference was they had the backing and the money to let them carry on until they became, until they found a way to, to make the money, right? Now, we weren't in competition with Facebook. We were a totally different proposition. But my point is the same is that I am 100% sure that we were right and the board was wrong because everything that's happened subsequently has played out to demonstrate that that was true. The future was online courses. Um, people spend billions learning online. And back then it was like, well, nobody's going to learn online. Nobody wants to learn online. I'm like, are you guys crazy? They were also, you know, there was an age difference between us and them. And, and so for me, the biggest mistake was that I didn't listen to myself and I allowed myself to be bullied or swayed by 
a board that didn't really understand the product proposition that we had. And we were ahead of our time. Right? We, were, we were absolutely ahead of our time. There's no question of it. We were the first people in the UK to be doing online courses for business. We were the first people in the UK to be building a dedicated online business community. Um, we were the first people in the UK to be doing dedicated awards that were that were homegrown, that were not voted for by like a magazine or, the, or a newspaper. But actually, our awards were voted for by people's customers, by by your actual by actual people. It's like the People's Choice Awards, right? Sure. And we, were, we, we were breaking the mold because we were entrepreneurs. We knew in our blood what other people like us wanted, but the board didn't. So the board was too far removed. And they thought, I believe they did think, I believe that what they suggested, they thought was the right thing, but it wasn't. And so my biggest mistake was allowing myself to be, honestly, the word that comes to mind is bullied, but I'm going to go with persuaded into doing something that I didn't believe was the right path for the company. And what I should have done was I should have said, no, I'm not doing this. I'm out and I'm going to take everything with me and we're going to go rebuild ourselves elsewhere. That's what I should have done. Kind of a lot to unpack there. Was some of the, the board's reticence because of the external economy? And, and the yeah. issue with, you know, you already got off a, a third of the funding that you wanted. Oh, of course. But so what? Like, that's life. Suck it up. Deal with it. Like, like are we building a business for the future or are we just trying to survive day to day? Because if we're trying to survive day to day, we might as well just go open up a shop on the high street. That's not what we were here for. We we were here to do something different and, and, and to level the playing field. And you can't level the playing field by doing the same old, same old to the same old people in the same old way. And do you also think, because there's obviously, it sounds like there's a couple of timing problems here in some ways, that obviously there was the economic conditions and the banking crisis, and you were essentially looking for banking funding. So that's prop timing problem number one. But then yeah. there's timing problem number two, which is in some ways that it sounds like you were quite ahead of the curve, as, as you mentioned about online courses yeah. and building an online community, which oh, in 2023 is absolute standard, but wow. you were 15 years ago. Right. And that is a real problem. Okay. So when you are the person who is running a business that is way ahead of the curve, even though everything in your being knows that you are right, you either have to have very deep pockets of your own, or you need a sponsor and a champion who has very deep pockets and will back you and believe in you. And if you don't have either of those, you're going to come across big problems because it's very hard for other people to see into the future in the same way that you can. And it's easy in 2023 to look back and go, what a bunch of videos? How could they not see this? <laughs> Duh, of course everything's driven online. Of course everything's driven by community. But like you said, 15 years ago, we were the only ones doing it. Oh, in hindsight, is obviously, uh, you know, a wonderful thing. Yeah. Um, so you talked about you wish you had sort of packed up and taken the concept and all the brand with you and, and moved on. Why didn't you do that? I don't think so. So, uh, wow, well, there's lots of reasons to unpack. Um, very sadly, um, my son's dad passed away during that period as well. So I found myself being a single mom running a business, uh, a, a widow, and it's no fucking me be. And I just don't think I could fight fires on all fronts. I think I only had the capacity to do what I could do. And I just didn't have the fight in me to be able to take that on as well as having to take care of my, you know, my son by my, it was just a lot for anyone to deal with. And I think that if my situation had been different, you can probably already tell I'm quite fiery. I stand up for what I believe in. I go back down. I, I would have, I would have handled it differently, but I just don't think I, ha I just don't think I had it in me at that point. Mm, no, obviously, that, you know, that is a significant set of circumstances to be, as you said, battling with across um, all those different facets. You mentioned about the conflict and the bullying. Obviously, it sounds a bit like, you, you know, you've always used the word battle as well. It's, it sounds like it was quite, yeah, I, I suppose a bit like a, a fight. Is that true? Oh, what one hundred percent! I was dealing with a boardroom full of white men who 
were used to just being told because they were wealthy that everything they did was correct. Uh, and, you know, um, sadly, not much has changed for most businesses, right? So if we look at the, 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 the funding landscape in 2023, if you go for funding, whether it's private equity, VC, angel investment, the, the vast majority of the time, especially in more institutional investment, you will be greeted with a panel of all white men and mm -hmm. women receive less than 2% of VC funding. So yeah. the chances are your board will be made up of all white men. And the chances are they will all be wealthy either in their own rights or they'll be paid a huge amount of money from the VC fund that they work for. And most of them will not have actual real entrepreneurial experience. So they will be able to look at things from a theoretical perspective and analyze your spreadsheets to your kingdom come. But they will very rarely have been at the cold face of business mm -hmm. and, and experienced anything their business is going through. And fundamentally, I think that's 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 a big challenge with the the landscape. Did you have any choice about who was on that board? Um, to a degree, and and also, I think it, I want to make it really clear that there were people on that board who who absolutely supported me, um, and were very outspoken in their support. But you know, if you're outnumbered, you're out you're outnumbered, and um, I I just think that's that's a lesson for for founders and entrepreneurs to, to really think that when you're going to raise cash, it's really, really important to understand that you're getting into a relationship with someone. And if you wouldn't have that person in your home for a weekend, mm -hmm. I would highly recommend you don't take a penny of their money and you hold out until you find somebody that you are more aligned with because that's really important. It's really important to be aligned with your investors. You want people on your team. It's got to feel like you're on one team. You know, it, 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 it's, it's, not, it's not supposed to feel combative. You're not supposed to feel like you have to persuade your board that, that your vision is the right vision. Your board should be a sounding board and your board absolutely should question some of your major decisions because that's healthy. But you shouldn't feel like you have to justify your company's vision every single time you go to a board meeting. Was there any moments that you look back on in hindsight where you could see that there was that misalignment and you see that there was that conflict brewing? I Honestly, I think it's really hard for me, Jess, because given everything else that I had going on in that period in time, mm. uh, I probably... I probably wouldn't have picked up on it in the same way that I would have done in different circumstances. And how did, what did that fall out of that kind of business look like? How did it sort of, you know, what? So I, I, I eventually left and, um, and, and took my equity, um, and they replaced me with a new CEO and over the next three years, they drove the business into the ground. So, Right. You know, it, 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 it didn't work out the way they thought, right? So they put somebody else in to do what they said and what they thought was the right thing. And again, I, I do believe that they genuinely did think that what they were doing was the right thing. And hindsight is a wonderful thing, but they were wrong and I was right. And that's just a fact. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that, that would be the case all the time, but in that particular incident, mm -hmm. that I'm sure there could be many times when they would have been right and I would have been wrong. But in that instance, I just knew in my bones that the future was online learning. I knew in my bones that everybody was desperate for community. I knew in my bones that I knew what people wanted because I was one of them. And the difference was they were too far removed. So what they thought people wanted was based on a theory, whereas mine was based on reality. It's kind of surprising, actually, because, you know, social media in 2008 did exist, you know, there was communities building online. So it's kind of feels a little bit short-sighted for them to be dismissing it, I suppose. When you got, or when you jumped ship and, and took your equity and, and left, how, how did that kind of feel on a personal level? I'm super resilient. And again, I think because of other things I had going on, I was like, I shut the door, I'm gone, next. Like, I didn't let it hold me back. I didn't let it, um, I wasn't depressed. I was very pragmatic and stoic. That's chapter, it's finished, next. 
I also had my son to take care of and, and consider and I knew that I could I couldn't be in this no man's land for very long. And um, you know, I, I've never really been one to do the Paul Me syndrome and I, I I just needed to throw my efforts and attention to something else, which is what I did. And I, interestingly what I did was I started to build up my own personal brand and I started to do online courses and <laughs> We did incredibly well. We have sold thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of online courses and made millions and millions in the process of doing so. So I guess in a way that was my way of saying, you know, I was right. <laughs> and, yeah. Um, and I think I just threw myself into, into work and into, you know, a new direction. Was that an immediate, um, sort of pivot into that or you know how long of yeah three months three months mm. yeah, pretty immediate so so you didn't kind of yeah as you say there was no kind of wallowing no. it doesn't help it doesn't help and in fact i think i you know i can't quite remember like specifically but no what i'm like i probably would have thought to myself fuck that if i wallow they win so i'm not wallowing mm. do you think it helped that that Failure came at a sort of what would you say is midway through your career to date that you had the resilience built up. Do you think that if it had happened earlier in your career, you might not have approached it or coped with it the same way? I think I would have coped with it just the same way. I think I'm just a resilient person. I think I've been through so much in my life before I even started working that the mm. I'm just by nature, right? If you've gone through, you know, if you've gone through a dysfunctional childhood, if you've had, you know, Unfortunately, some people, you know, live an entire life by the time they're 18, right? You, you, and, and that was my life. And so um, I always think about, well, what's the worst that could happen? Okay, well, the worst that could happen in this situation is incomparable to the worst that has happened to me in other situations. So fuck it. Just move on. I just, yeah, it doesn't even compare. Mm, definitely. That's, that's so true. And I think back to, you know, back to what we were talking about before, actually, about, you know, your sort of circumstances of and the upbringing that people have and how that impacts on their abilities and drive to be entrepreneurs as well. Has that now changed given that, that sort of failure? 100%. I, I, I will listen to other people, but I will only make decisions based on my own instinct about because the buck stops here. So I have to live with this decision for right or for wrong. So I'm not saying that I only follow my own instinct because I'm always right. What I'm saying is if I follow your instinct, but I think they're wrong, but I follow your instinct, I'm still gonna have to pay the price. And so if it's wrong, I'm gonna blame you, but I still have to pay the price. So my view now is I will absolutely listen to everybody. And I think that that's a really healthy thing to do. I think it's very healthy to question whether what you think is right is actually right. Because if you can provide me an alternative way of looking at what I'm looking at, maybe I won't do a 180 degree U-turn, but maybe it will just help me see things from a slightly different angle and perspective. So maybe it will change my response to a degree. And and, and that can be super beneficial, right? Because no, no one is right all the time. But ultimately, I will only ever do what I believe in now because if I don't I still have to pay the price and what about kind of dealing with kind of conflict and you know board conflict are you approaching that differently now uh I would choose my investors entirely differently so yeah my my my, my remit for investors is very very clear um, I would insist, I would never dilute myself beyond the point of control. I would always want a golden vote in my contract, which means I can outvote everybody because, you know, it's my blood, sweat and tears that created this. Um, I would have a very strong board around me. And a strong board, by the way, doesn't have to mean that everybody's in agreement with you. What it means is that they won't let anyone be bullied. 
the the they they back the founder unless the founder is actually doing something that's detrimental to the company. I would also make sure that my board was diverse so that my board wasn't like eight white men. That we had women on the board, we had you know people who are non-white on the board, male or female, or male and female, because actually. It doesn't really matter what sector you're in. We are all in businesses that serve everyone to one degree or another. And so by having a board that is only represented one part of the population, I don't think it's good for business. I don't think it's good for anybody's business because you're seeing, you, you're, you're, you're getting advice through one set of experiences, which is very different to other people's set of experiences. Absolutely. And in, obviously in your case, it might have yielded a different result if you had, I suppose, at that point in time, more diversity. Is there any other lessons that you've taken from it? Uh, yep. Yeah, don't take money on unless you absolutely need it. Like, you know, do everything you can without it first. Um, uh, all money is not created equal. So uh, somebody can offer you a million dollars here and a million dollars there. They're not the same, but you know, What's the nature and the type of personality of the person? Are they insisting on a board seat? Like, don't just give board seats away because that just ties you up in headaches. You don't need to do that. It's unnecessary. Um, ask for more money than you need. That's another one that's really important for women because women tend to undervalue the amount that they need. And so they tend to be underfunded because they don't ask for enough money. Men tend to ask for more money than they need. So they get at least what they need or more. And then they have a longer runway. And the longer runway you have to build success in your business, the more likely you are to be successful. In terms of that funding gap, though, do you think that that was even possible at the time that you were fundraising? Because obviously you said you were fundraising and you only made a third of that, obviously given the sort of banking crisis. Do you think that was even possible? I don't know because we had all of it allocated. So this is the biggest problem. So we had all of it allocated. And literally overnight, we lost two thirds of it because the fund shut down. Like, because they were in the middle of the uh, subprime, they were in the middle of the subprime housing market, which is so their fund had invested in the subprime market, which is really was at the epicenter of the 2008 2009 banking crisis. So they were all shut down, locked down, everything kind of like unraveled. So, so in hindsight, sometimes there are things you just can't do anything about, right? And that that was one of them. Um, but I think the bin biggest funding question now is that how, how do we get more female founders funded? That like that has to be addressed. It has to be addressed because less than two percent of all institutional money goes to women. That that's crazy. That's just crazy. But that's back to what you said earlier in terms of the amount of institutional investors and who makes up those boards making those decisions. Yeah. Oh, I presume anyway. Not I think it's a number of things. I think that's absolutely it. So you, you very rarely see another woman opposite you. So you don't see a woman on the VC side. So that needs to change. We need more women in the VCs. We need more non-white people in the VCs. We need more diversity in the VCs. But equally, we need the funnel to change, right? So we need more women pitching. So out of 100 pitches, how many of those were women and how many of those were men? Because that's another part of the equation. It's not just... You know, if less than 2% of funding goes to women, but only four out of 100 pitches are from women, then it's, you know, that's one story, right? And so my argument is we need to provide proper support and workshops for women who want to get funded so they have the vocabulary and the connections and the confidence to be able to go in and pitch. Because that's what it's really about. It's about equipping women with the tools and the connections and the, the the confidence to go and pitch. Because the more women who pitch, the more women will get funded. And also you're, you know, a great role model for them all as well. And so how do you think that's that failure has helped your achievements in the last fifteen years kind of since? Well, I was going to give you an answer, but I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you, because my, my, my sound of response to that is it's just proof that, you know, I'm not a one trick pony. Nobody is. If, if you had a setback, you can come back. You can always go again. Doesn't matter what's happened. You can pick yourself up and go forward. So, so I, I would, I would say, you know, that's, that's my first response. So what it taught me is that, you know, 
it's never over until it's over, right? Like it, 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 it was just a chapter and we moved on. But actually what I'm going to tell you is this. I want to tell you that most recently, so I, I haven't used LinkedIn for about seven years. And um, recently because of, uh, I've got an event in December called with the London Stock Exchange called Rise of the Female Entrepreneur. It's an incredible event, really excited for it. And I realized, you know what, I kind of got to get back on LinkedIn and I need to update my profile. <laughs> I need to do these things. And so I started doing it. I was like, wow, I forgot how well connected I am. And I started reaching out to people about the event and if they'd come and speak and if they'd support and if they're sponsored. Everybody was saying yes. And I was like, wow, this is really easy. And then I realized, well, actually, you know what it is, is that the you had built up such good equity with people from from what we'd done at Smarter. So so whilst it hadn't worked with the investors, with the people who used our services, oh my, you know, you know we absolutely over delivered there. And here's what was really interesting: our five calls that I got on with either sponsors or speakers, three of them said, "Oh, I just need to tell you a story about Smarter." The reason that we're connected because we went to this event and we started our business because of Smarter. So whatever you want us to do, the answer is yes, because I don't think we'd be here if it wasn't Smarter. That, that was everything. That was literally everything for me. Legacy. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah I really felt like, wow, we, we did good shit. Stuff that I'm really proud of. And that's, and that's quite an interesting insight because in some ways, obviously, the business didn't work out how you wanted it to, but it still had some positive impact, which is still massive, you know, having an impact on businesses today. So is, is it a failure, really? No, I see. You see, that is is turned my mind because like I was like, wow, I can't believe all these years later. Like literally, I've had two calls this week and, you know. He was saying, oh, you know, I first met you when you did the Smash 100 and we were put forward to this award. And, you know, there's this company, there's another company called Mercer and they, and they do this great hand cream and they've got a brilliant, brilliant business. And 10% of their profits goes back to uh, frontline nurses and, and products and things. Anyway, the guy founded this business off the back of Smarter. He came to our events, workshops, we helped him set up. I've even forgotten it. He reached out to me and said, look, whatever you want, we're in. And then I thought, okay. It wasn't a failure. It was a success. Interesting. Uh, it's just, uh, and how do you see failure in business? How do you, I mean, that's a really great example. Do you see it as a failure or do you see it as a success? How do you, or, and what you, what is your advice to other people in business that have failed? Well, I think, you know, take the lesson that I've just shared with you today. You might have failed in one way. But where did you succeed? And take the lessons from both things, right? So we definitely failed at something and we definitely succeeded at others. So take the lessons from both and use those in what you do going forward. And I speak to a lot of entrepreneurs and I, you know, I've had people on this podcast who talk about a fear of actually failing and a fear of not succeeding and therefore not necessarily wanting to start what a sort of advice or guidance would you give to them well you'll 100 percent fail if you don't start like that's just batshit crazy stupid like just think it through if you don't start you are 100 percent gonna fail and i would say to people start and expect to fail be prepared to fail and what you learn from your first failure, you take through to your next success. I, I, I think that we just look at failure wrong. It's like it's binary. You either win or you lose. You either fail or you succeed. But that's just not true. There's nuances to it. It's not black or white. It's gray. There are parts that you fail, parts that you succeed. And in the process, you're learning as you go. And if we, are, if we were all so worried about failing, then nothing would ever change like you know nothing would ever change do you think that failure is inevitable as part of the business journey well if you're going to be in business for more than a hot minute then 100 percent, absolutely you will fail out multiple things and that's okay mm. no that's a sound advice 
So if you could go back in time and erase that that failure from happening, would you do it? Oh, one hundred percent. Yeah. You would erase it. Yeah. You would. You wouldn't want it to happen. No, I would erase it. And I'd get rid of my board, and I'd have a new. I'd have a new board, and new investors, and we'd make a success. But do you wish that it didn't happen? That's a hard thing to say, really, because I think that by the nature of what we were doing, I kind of feel like I have to say, yeah, I wish it didn't happen. I wish because it's not that I didn't learn from the failure, and I know that's kind of the point that you're getting to, but actually we helped so many people that as a result of us failing, we weren't able to help all those people. So, yeah, if I had a choice, we wouldn't have failed. 100%. percent mm. yeah. So, good on wrapping up now, and we always end on a quick fire round. So this is short questions and and short answers. So are uh, you ready? Go. Failure is inevitable. What is your life's mission? To help everybody fulfill their greatest human potential. What's one piece of advice that you would want to give on your deathbed? Hire a cleaner. <laughs> um, brilliant. What's one habit that keeps you resilient? Everything is a muscle. So going to the gym keeps you resilient, but you have to work out your brain in the same way you work out your body. Resilient. How do you do that? So, so for me, um, definitely fitness is, is, is a priority for me. And um, it's a very weird thing to explain because it's about having an inner self-confidence. It's not about being arrogant. It's not about being egotistical. It's about deep down knowing how good you really are. And I think it's really sad that most people don't know or acknowledge how good they really are, which is why my great, you know, my life's mission is to help everybody do that, right? So whilst business is my medium underneath all of that, it's really how, how can I help everyone fulfill their greatest human potential? Because I feel very blessed that my whole entire life, despite my circumstances, despite what has gone on, I've always had that absolute unshakable belief in myself. Mm. Okay, love it, yeah. If you could be immortal, would you take it? Fuck me with the state of the world today. No, I don't think I would, no. Unless I could be immortal and run and run the world at the same time, then I might think about it. That's a whole nother podcast. Um, yeah. What's one surprising fact that people don't know about you? Well, I would say that I was the world's only licensed female boxing manager, licensed by the British Boxing Board of Control. But if you Google me, that's probably the first thing that comes up. <laughs> um, I don't know. I think I'm pretty much an open book. I think... What's one thing that people would find surprising around me? I don't drink. I've never drunk. I don't drink alcohol. I've never drunk alcohol. Uh, not for any particular reason. I just never started and now I don't really see the point. There we go. So what guest or person can you recommend that you think I should have on? Oh, well, I'm a little bit biased because I uh, have just secured the incredible Trini Woodall as our keynote speaker at our event in December and um, I think her story is amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. So that's it. So, um, Char, where can people um, connect with you and find you? Find me uh, unusual name, easy to find, Shaw Wasman. To find me on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook or just go to shaw.com S-H-A-A.com and obviously you've got, you know, plenty of books as well on, on Amazon, lots of bestsellers. I've got loads of bestsellers on Amazon, yeah. You can find me, you know, just type my name into Google. Something will come up. Brilliant. Well, um, thanks so much for, for being here. Really enjoyed this conversation. Um, and there's so much value. Um, and, yeah, 
hopefully we could do a part two at some point out in the future. Definitely. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you for being so patient with me. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Fail. Really hope you enjoyed this episode and learned something new. Please do subscribe to the show and leave us a review. It really does help us to grow and to reach more people. Do follow us on social media too. We're at Jeswood on Instagram and at Beyond the Fail on YouTube and also on Linktree. Thanks again and see you soon.